Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Doom Drop Podcast. It's been a long hiatus, three weeks since we did our last episode, but we are back. A lot of things have happened. How are you doing, Shin? I'm doing pretty good, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. It's ASL Finals Week, and uh, yeah. now I won't spoil anything, but I'm a little bit frustrated with the matchup that we're, we're going to watch. I mean, it's not um, it's not ideal, but um, it, sh- it should be exciting nonetheless, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I really do want to talk about it, but obviously I, I won't. But um, all, all I'll say is you know that there is one player in question that I'm particularly happy about. Oh, yeah. So I'll be I'll be uh, happy just because of that reason, even if the other situation is not as ideal. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm always excited when ASL season comes to a close because we can get more eyes on KCM and other other casts and stuff like that. But um, it's like a bittersweet pill, right? Like I wanna mm-hmm. I wanna get people watching, but I also love to watch the ASL. So uh, it goes both ways, I guess. <laughs> yeah it can't be helped though right it's just such a popular event that it kind of just overshadows everything for a little while yeah it's true um people don't have time a lot of people are just um you know super super busy with life kids family we've been talking a little bit about that before we started the episode yeah. but you know that that stuff does get in the way of starcraft sometimes doesn't it oh yeah it can't yeah i mean <laughs> most of the most of the like age range probably somewhere around like 25 to 35 the most average age range of people playing starcraft as well so those guys are probably you know way too busy with their real lives it's like they're in college or something and have a lot of time dedicated to gaming or whatever yeah for sure um i I think that's the 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 age range for most of my videos is like 25 to 40 so i mean it's a great demographic if you're looking for advertise or if you're an advertiser looking to sell something but if you're uh, just trying to get people's eyes on something, that those guys don't have a lot of time. No, they're either in like you know full time jobs or with have their families to worry about, or you know both in a lot of cases. So yeah, not gonna have a lot of extra time to listen to podcasts and watch uh, StarCraft games if they've also got other events to keep an eye on. By the way, I heard from some people that uh, they want to see this on Spotify so that people can listen to it while they do other things. Oh. Um, yep. We're going to be looking into that. I'm not sure what it costs or what's all involved to make that happen, but we'll we'll look into it here um, yeah. in the future. We're always trying to find new ideas to make these things better, uh, KCM or this podcast or otherwise. So let us know in the comments, guys, what you think can be improved upon. We're going to try some new things here today as well. Yeah, we're going to do a little bit of a visual representation. And I think that's one of the things that, is what we need more of is like you know more visuals to look at while we're talking well we're in the uh, creative space of youtube we're in, we're in this medium we might as well use some visuals right before we switch over completely yeah. to spotify um make full <laughs> use of this like joe rogan <laughs> <laughs> well we have some videos to watch today we're going to talk a little bit about future upcoming rts because you know we've been playing the same game for you know some of us for 25 years it's been out for a long long time um long and time nothing's really matched it in my mind um i don't i can't speak right. for you as well Shun, but i i think that starcraft yeah, no, has same. really hit a, a note in uh gaming that just hasn't been matched um and there's a lot of games that are coming out soon that are seeking to kind of take over that mantle that are seeking to to do that to to hit that same note but i don't know a lot of them seem to be hit missing the mark and i think more so we're not going to be looking for that one to um to take over that position that's in our hearts for starcraft brood war i think we're going to be looking at these to kind of pick out the reasons why um they might not be as successful as something like brood war we're going to kind of critique them a little bit and and kind of look at it from like a critical lens like why is what what is it that they're doing wrong and how can the developers in the future try to rekindle that success or recapture that success well yeah i don't think they want to repeat 
the same mistake that they did with WoW because they back in the day, like everyone was talking about like what's going to be the next WoW killer, or what's the WoW killer, you know? And right. if, they, if they look at it the same way with StarCraft, like oh, what's going to be the StarCraft killer? And I, I don't think you're going to do that because the only way you could create a game that replaces StarCraft is if it had the same kind of lack of features which make it so charming, like the lack of autonomy uh, and autonomous, uh, sorry, auto- auto- automatic like features with like say the SCVs mining without you telling them to or whatever like if you make a game that's like more like starcraft 2 where it's like focused more on the strategic element of the game rather than like the mechanical element then i think that you lose the charm of the game so i don't know how you can replace that without making a game that's deliberately frustrating and that will be a high barrier of entry to new players and not attract a large enough player base so most developers aren't going to go that route right right so yeah the the mistakes of the past right there's um I, I I've just been thinking a lot about this game recently um because both Artosis and Tasteless made a video about it but it hasn't been released no footage has been released of it at all it's in development and um I just wanted to briefly mention and talk about it as a David Kim uh game that's yeah, coming out I heard soon. About that. Um, well, just talk quickly about who David Kim is, since if we're going to name drop someone, we should maybe give them a quick little synopsis. So David Kim is like a very, very talented player from Canada, and uh, he ended up being in charge of the balancing for StarCraft 2, and now it seems that he's creating his own game, or what is working on his own game, which uh, I think a lot of people have spoken highly of, right? Yeah, Uncapped Games. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the name of the game that's coming out, but uh, that's at least the um the dev name the, the so dev to speak. name yeah uncapped games and they're planning to release uh some sort of uh trailer or something coming up soon but it's it's very exciting because one thing that um i saw in an interview with david kim was that he was kind of looking back at the mistakes of the past you know you're talking about having those extra Uh, inputs necessary in starcraft brood war you know you need to micromanage all these things there's not a lot of automation going on well the way that starcraft 2 tried to handle that was by adding in a lot of kind of useless busy work is what david kim called it which is like dropping mules and hitting Mm. injects and chrono boosting stuff right they have some value strategically but they're mostly just busy work that is going to like keep you moving because the actual macro aspect of the game and the you know those those things are mostly automated so right i liked what he was saying in his interview even though we haven't seen any part of the game is that he's looking at those things and realizing that they were mistakes and you know, trying to make a better version, like trying to be, um, you, you know, better than StarCraft Two. He's trying to Im- make improvements and like uh, really recognize and, and analyze the mistakes that were made. Well, it sounds like what he's trying to do is, and he's he's assessed the situation and realized, okay, StarCraft Two is a half measure. We've tried to like automate starcraft but we didn't push it far enough like we can't focus enough on the strategic element because we're just like creating like useless filler stuff for people to do that's not actually adding anything to the game when and it's not really making any any more dynamic and if anything with legacy of the void they have the 12 workers start which makes the early game even less dynamic so yeah maybe if they did completely go the other direction where they went all the way automated so it's everything is just focused on the unit control and the strategic element maybe that would be something more enticing rather than how StarCraft 2 is today. I wonder if that's the direction they're going to go. Um, if there'll be more... Uh, maybe there's going to be like more resources in this new game or something like that. You know, something that requires your attention for macro. Different balancing acts different and stuff. balancing acts that you have to kind of, you know, different plates to spin that, right, aren't, right. that aren't just kind of redundant that aren't just busy mm-hmm. work, you know what I mean? To, to make that um, more challenging, but also, you know, more, more fun and more rewarding. Engaging, I think, is yeah. the word they would like to use. Yeah, they would yeah. want to find something that's engaging. Engaging, so, rewarding. You, 
yeah, as long as you have an engaging gameplay loop, it's going to give you that kind of like dopamine hit that's satisfying as you just play the game more and more. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we don't really have a whole lot that we can talk about for that. I just wanted to mention that straight up um, off the bat here. Uh, the uncapped games, that's big news that's just come out in the past like week or so. Um, but we don't have any footage of that, so we can't really talk too, too much about it until mm -hmm. you know the the actual game is is revealed but we've got plenty of trailers here that we can take a look at and i want to i want to show you this trailer here i don't think you've you've seen too many uh upcoming games have you Shun? no no i'm I'm not at all actually so i'm actually really excited to check this out because you did tell me before the podcast that we were going to be doing trailers and i've been kind of excited about it okay let me can edit out this part quickly i'm and just gonna later on i also wanted later on i also wanted to touch upon about what makes starcraft so interesting and engaging which and how can we replicate that because there is a few things i think we could talk about which because there's a lot a lot of things about starcraft which are frustrating but i think a lot of that frustration leads to what makes it so charming and rewarding when you're playing it but i wanted to talk about that maybe a bit later when we're not focused on the trailers okay One of the first things I want to say about this trailer and uh, this game is that they're making one of the biggest mistakes, I think, that uh, has been plaguing the RTS industry recently is that it's very difficult Visuals. to, yeah, it's very difficult to yeah, distinguish what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, I know exactly what you're, I knew exactly what you're going to say. Yeah, it's very dark. It's, it's there's, there's no easy distinguishable silhouettes to really like actually see what's going on there, like. Yeah, there's a lot of similar colors. There's, uh, you know, a lot of shadows and stuff. I I do like the blood and the visual. The the visuals look cool, but I just can't really tell what I'm looking at a lot of the time. Yeah, I feel like I'm I'm watching like you know how like say like the end of Game of Thrones like where they had the the big battles like but it was like really dark and you couldn't even tell what was going on. I feel like we're looking at the, the RTS equivalent of that. Like it's very Hollywood, but it's not really good for like actual competitive gameplay. Yeah. And just getting people to watch a, an RTS game is is tough. Um, to make an RTS that's got longevity, something like StarCraft, you need to have the viewer aspect be really crisp. You know, you want to be able to see what's going right. on and and understand what's happening in the game so that you can get excited about it. If if you're just trying to play like a single player experience, maybe this is not a big issue. But if you really want to we talked about a starcraft killer i'm not i'm not uh, thinking that this is going to be that game but i feel like right. to to get an rts with longevity you have to have that viewer experience yeah there is one interesting thing i do like though is that it, in the resources it does look like you need to have a, a a fuel upkeep for your units as in just running these tanks is costing you fuel to operate them Mm. So I'm one. So maybe that would create some interesting situations where you're spending more more fuel than you're currently mining, and you, you've got a reserve of fuel, and eventually you'll run dry on your fuel if you don't get more kind of thing. I kind of like that element. Right. So you could cut off the opponent's fuel source, and then maybe their army runs out of fuel and they can't move anymore, right. or something like that. That's that'd be interesting. That yeah. is interesting. Um, I don't know what some of these other resources are. Looks like we've got recycling up there. <laughs> I'm not really sure. But <laughs> this is all alpha footage as well, so um, the game doesn't have a release date yet. Let's keep it going here. I think I did see for a moment there a secondary race. Did you did you see that? Did you pick yeah. up on that? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It looks yeah. like we've got like the Protoss race or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so it looks like it's a trilogy. Like you got the Zerg, you got the Protoss, and you got the Terran kind of thing. Yeah, something like that. This does look very distinct, right? You've got the 
the the white versus the red, right? But just it looks look like Tau from forty k, right? Well, look at the bottom left. Like, how can we tell the difference between any of those things? Like, so the bottom left looks like just a um, um like just a yeah, like just a um, a mush of units. Whereas the these are this other race actually does have some distinguishable features, which do make it pop a little bit more on the screen. So this race looks a lot more better designed, I would say. Yeah, but uh, they do seem to be more focused on the the Terran race, I guess, right now. Um, that's mm. what most of the footage is. We just get to see these guys for a second. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting, right? It it does look like um, a more gritty RTS right. than a lot of the ones that we've seen recently. And that's something I've been it, complaining it, about is, like, a lot of these new RTS, they look so cartoon-like, whereas this one kind of looks... Like it, it, it's not like StarCraft at all with the, the art style, but it does have that kind of grittiness attached to it. Yeah, I would also say that with the air units that I've seen now, it also gives me a little bit of a Commander and Conqueror Generals vibes as well. Mm, they're flying really like almost above the screen in some cases. I wonder how that's going to work. Yeah. Is that going to be just like uh, you call in an airstrike and they fly, they fly in that direction, or are you actually controlling those units? Well, they, like I said, with the generals thing, it might be that you have some control in the sense of you give them commands, but they're autonomous in the sense of how they move around the screen and carry out those commands. Right, right. That's interesting. Um, could be something cool to to mix in. I'm I'm a big fan of Command and Conquer. Not as like a, I don't think they really hit like the the balance for Command and Conquer is makes it almost impossible to have it as like a competitive RTS, but I think it's a, a fun right. series that it does deserve some more um it deserves some more thought. It deserves some more time. And unfortunately right now all I've seen from Command and Conquer recently is a new mobile game that's coming out. I was actually gonna put that up as a trailer, but just as a joke, but you know, it is a joke. That they really should have another Command and Conquer yeah. PC game. So, by the way, now looking at the resources, it looks like the top one is actually related to the unit supply. And I imagine there's like unit cards that fill out and you each unit card has like a certain cost. And you're like, like in 40k where you're filling out how many points you got. So like you've got this amount of point value of an army to work mm -hmm. with. Hmm. And you can see how he's got the, the money to, to refill because he's got like 2,800 there and he can go up to 750 in his army control, I guess. Right. Interesting. I uh I don't know if I like the map being at the top right hand corner, but uh, that is that is kind of cool. Maybe you could change it in the settings though. A lot of I games wonder. nowadays will allow you to flip it, right? Yeah. I wonder if they would have that so you could put it in the bottom left or whatnot. It does look pretty cool though. I mean, visually, I don't I don't know what this part is all about. Like they're doing some sort of um, uh, what is this? Uh, map movement. Did you did you see that for a moment? It seems like more of a single player. Well, that's what I, this is the vibe I was getting from looking at it. It does yeah. seem more like a campaign RTS rather than like a player online against people. But maybe it has both. Maybe it has like a, it's focused on a campaign element, but it also has like online capability. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where this is going to go. But I thought this was an interesting place to start. The visual aspect, a little bit uh, rough, uh, a little bit difficult to understand what's going on in the fights probably um the grittiness is there uh, but there's there's some things to be desired right um the next mm -hmm. one we're going to take a look at is actually more towards command and conquer uh let me bring that up here okay let's take a look at this All right, right off the bat, um, this kind of struck me as really reminiscent of like old, um, either Command and Conquer or you know those early cutscenes from StarCraft yeah. World War. Like, yeah, there's kind of, that has that sort of that retro visual thing going on here. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of refreshing. It's kind of cool. Like they're. You know, maybe they just don't have money. I know this is a this is a small game, um, kind of like an indie game, but um, 
it it's maybe they don't have money to do it, but it's cool to to see them lean into that kind of retro mm-hmm. uh, cinematic instead of you know trying to match the visuals of some of these bigger games yeah. that are going so cartoony. You know, let's, let's yeah, take... that's the way forward. I think. Yeah. Tiberian Sun visual flick. This right here reminds me of like Tiberian Sun. Look at the the yeah. miners here. It, it, yeah. I think that's a miner anyway. Yes, uh, I think so. Like grabbing resources off the ground. I yeah, as soon as as soon as I saw the gameplay, I immediately thought Tiberian Sun. Yeah, pretty interesting. Like uh, going that direction and the way that the buildings are kind of blocking the sight lines uh, of the player. Really reminds me of the Command and Conquer series as well, right? Like mm-hmm. you can't see kind of past a lot of the buildings here uh, because the the angle of the viewer is so low in comparison to something like StarCraft, where you're almost above everything. Yeah, it gives a real dynamic feel to like combat that takes place in the urban environments on the map. Mm-hmm. Let's keep going. Some of the visuals here are really cool. Like I, I really like how distinct each unit is. Um, right. They're not going for like, oh, this is a tank and this is like a, a battle tank and this is a, you know what I mean? Like they're they're really going out there with the way that the different units are visually. You've got this walker thing. You had that that um, strange like spinning turret with two turrets hanging down. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of really big, powerful units that you can build probably in the later game that uh, are, you know, scary to deal with. Yeah, it's both adventurous and it's aesthetic, but it also gives you that visual distinction to tell what's going on, on the screen. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of digging the uh, visuals of just the background and everything like that. It looks the, the aesthetic is is pretty cool. The art style is yeah, the art style is pretty cool. I like it so far. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's not um, it's not really cartoonish, and it 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 gives you like the vibe of I don't know if this is off world or is this like a some futuristic um, you know, post apocalyptic situation. But you know the the latter actually the buildings and everything seem really. Uh, interestingly designed you know what i mean like this these are obviously right. on the left hand side here not uh buildings that you would build i think in the game but yeah it's more like buildings yeah more like command and conquer with a lot of neutral buildings around that kind of set the scene and it's kind of setting an interesting scene for me I'm, I'm curious about what's going on there yeah i'm also thinking that maybe that's a building that's walking a building. I'd be really curious. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be curious if you could move around your buildings, but they like 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 in Starcraft, they float mm. slowly. Maybe they walk slowly in this. Well, that would be interesting. All right, let's uh, let's keep it going. The the blimps, the flying blimps. That's the really twin good. blimps. Giving a command and conquer vibe for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's hard not. To, it's hard not to get big CNC vibes from this, and especially Tiberian Sun. I'm wondering what engine they're running on. Actually, I wonder if they've actually used any assets or anything from Tiberian Sun or anything like that. I wonder. Um, it almost feels like a like a Age of Empires esque engine. You know yes. what I mean? Like the way that the this buildings, wall, this wall, the wall. Like, yeah, this wall especially, right? Just like the Palisade wall in um, Age of Empires, right? Yeah, this is really reminiscent. Look at the big fist, um, pointing up on the the bottom underneath this blimp. That's that's it's got a finger me. pointing up with like fire coming out of the fingertip. <laughs> this, we've got some really cool design ideas in here. I don't know how this is gonna play or whether it'll be worth, um, you know playing or casting or you know being competitive in but um the the visual aspect is really intriguing here striking it's very striking the visuals i like it 
All right, keep going. <laughs> the tanks look a little bit like that big tank towards the end there mm -hmm. looked a little bit like some of the like the prototype tanks from like the world wars yeah yeah for sure like way too bulky um but yeah uh, unyieldly but I i'm kind of liking the I i'm a big fan of mad max um and like mm, a lot too. of this looks like mad max like a lot of these these yellow um car they look like cars that have been outfitted with you know, a lot of guns and, <laughs> and weapons and stuff. Like this one, yeah. this one right here. Wait, where is it? Um, this is like here. Mad like, Max, but with like Tiberian Sun technology almost. Yeah, yeah, a lot like that. Like look at these weird cars that they're driving right here. These are wild. It's like monster truck buggy type looking things as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool, man. I'm, I'm, I'm digging the aesthetic here a lot. I think this is going to be pretty fun to at least like play through the the campaign at the very least but, right um i think it i think anyone that has enjoyed those kind of games of past like like type and sun or whatever i think would have a, a good time playing this by the looks of it and one thing i'd like to point out is mini map in the bottom left so these are real gamers that are making this too yeah that's right <laughs> um i'm not sure about this build screen here at the top right i i'm not sure how that's gonna work but I'm guessing it's kind of like a. That's like, like CNC race, yeah. yeah. Red light, red light, red light series, probably. Yeah, um, I can't tell if you can run over units or anything. That's that's kind of the thing that really separates CNC from other mm -hmm. games is you, you, there's there's that aspect of like running over your enemy infantry and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> that we're gonna see another game is coming out uh, soon. And we're going to watch a trailer where that's actually possible. Another CNC-esque game is coming up next, guys. One, well, one thing I'd quickly like to say is like, it was really sat satisfying in like the original Red Alert where you had like five infantry units to one tile. So you could like run over five infantry units by just mm. driving over that tile. It's so satisfying. Rebel Command Uplink Initializer. Please stand by. Line across your Asia falls heavily affected by the fallout. You have proven yourself loyal to me so far, General. Our dynasty has waited long enough. Show me that my trust is not misplaced. Do you feel when that music hit? That was uh, that was pretty it's badass. Like uh, Doom Eternal, like Doom Eternal kind of vibes, almost, right? Yeah, it's um, composer for the music. I believe was the composer for CNC music. I'm not 100 percent sure of that though. There was uh, there's a famous composer that putting that's putting the music together for this. Let's see no. if we can get some um, some visuals here of the actual gameplay. There we go. So as you can see pretty good visually it's definitely hitting that gritty um rts feel without like i don't really see any cartoonish vibes from this at all like i'm not i'm not getting yeah. any of that like um uh, sort of star or uh warcraft or um starcraft 2 type of vibe like it's oh. like really yeah 
Well, even oh. though it's dark and gritty, there's still enough vibrancy there to kind of like give some edge to the silhouettes of like the tanks and what have you. Like, so mm -hmm. even though it is like dark, it's still not really impairing your your the visual rep representation of the units. Yeah, I I agree. It's it's pretty clear what's actually happening in a lot of these scenes. We also have some gameplay for this, so we can we can take a look at that. But um, we could just take a look at some stills here first. Like the base building really looks similar to CNC. Like you can see the walls mm -hmm. here. Uh, that last game we watched, Dorf, like the walls were way larger. They looked a lot more kind of uh, AOE. Um, yeah. Yeah much more like uh, Age of Empires, but well, here it's just totally CNC. He also looks like it has the same kind of wall mechanic that CNC does, right? We have this like wall and gate thing going mm -hmm. on, like some sandbags to the left as well. So very, very reminiscent of CNC in a lot of regards. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can grab another still here. Uh, some of the, the battle tanks, you know, the, the flame tanks, those type of things. But on the right here, you can see their resource, which is kind of like Tiberium, right? It's some sort of growth that uh, your uh, harvesters collect and bring back to the the station where the harvesters are built. So it, it's really, really similar to CNC in that way. And uh, I did hear that there were some uh, interesting aspects to the, the resource here is that it grows and then as you harvest it, it, it kind of recedes, but then it grows recedes, again. Yeah. And ah. as, it, as it grows bigger, if you like leave it for longer on the map, the value of harvesting it goes up. So like, let's so, say there's like a really, you know, hard battle in the early game um, where neither player is gathering a lot of resources. The value of the resources on the map is going to go way up. And then when you start, harvesting that you're going to get a huge boost of resources you see what i'm saying so it also could give you some comeback mechanics if like exactly. say you don't like expand early on and what have you you can play catch up because you've now got like an exponential growth on those resources that have yet been up untapped that makes sense uh, i kind of like that mechanic because it's interesting it will yeah. give a lot more dynamic feel to the early and mid game phases yeah it's it's pretty cool um as an idea i'm not sure how it's going to play out in the mm -hmm in the actual game, but it, uh, it definitely makes things more dynamic for the, the resource. Like it, it's actually some sort of changing, altering, a growing entity on the map, which is pretty cool. All right. That is very cool. I like that a lot. I really like this, the explosions here, you know, they're not, they're not like crazy over the top with, you know, all kinds of pieces flying mm. all over the place with, uh, what's it called? Um, you know, the, the real, uh, gravity simulated. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, right. in, in brood or in Starcraft two or something like that, where the parts of the bodies are going to fly all over the map and stuff like that. <laughs> um, what, what, what was that does... called? Like unreal, unreal engine type graphics yeah. this but, but it does seem to be some like interesting levels of visuals here like with the like the diffusion of the shock wave like the aesthetic like the tank to the north of the explosion like mm -hmm. there's, there's an interesting diffusion on that tank as a result of this explosion going off next to it in terms of the lighting effects and what have you yeah so i, I kind of like that a lot and it, it also seems like there's like a, a motion blur traveling with the shock wave of the explosion almost Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. So here's the, the harvester here. Um, and there's, of course, the, the resource. I can't remember what it's called, but um, growing out on the map, kind of taking over more area. And you can come in and start beating it back and harvesting that resource. Pretty cool little harvester there. Um, let's see here some more base um visuals here we've got uh i guess this is kind of like a factory building some neck mm -hmm. units i'm not sure what these buildings are though the buildings here in the center are we looking they at look like generators of some kind yeah like electricity or something or or supply 
I'm not sure. It's, yeah, one of those two or both, yeah. It does have... It, it kind of does look like a bit of Unreal Engine, some of the things, like the um, the trees and stuff like that, and some of the grass and everything does look pretty uh, true to life, but... Um, there's, there's, there's one criticism I would levy this, mm. is that it, it looks a little flat. You think so? I don't like how f I don't like how flat the terrain looks. Like for example, where these two like big explosions are, like yeah. it just looks a little bit too flat aesthetically. Right. The this th it doesn't look like a pothole. It looks like a flat um, spray. Like, it looks like just yeah. It looks like like just weird. Yeah, it's literally someone just like yeah, exactly. It's just it's just like one solid texture on the ground. It's not mm. actually like there's no bitmap there of like actually indenting into the terrain a little bit to give it that like depth. You know what I mean? Right. The flame looks very cool, though. The flame looks excellent. Yeah. Like, like it could ju just looks uh, like you could really see how the it's like spurting out, and then it's kind of like spreading the flame uh, as it hits the building here. Um, just contrast that to like what a fire bat looks like. <laughs> this is <laughs> this looks like a real flame hitting a building. It seems like an actual flame that's designed for war yeah let's, keep, let's see what else we got here all right some good building design here i'm not sure what type of building this is here it looks but... like a, a capture zone or something right it looks like mm -hmm. it's like a, a building to contest and to take over or something right well, there's definitely the ability to capture in this game. I saw that they have like engineers that can be used to capture buildings, kind of like CNC, mm -hmm. which is um, just interesting to see. We haven't seen uh, a lot of RTS utilize that mechanic since CNC, yeah. but uh, it can be. It can lead to some serious balance issues. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I like the uh, the uh, missile trail aesthetic of the, the the missile turret here. I like the to see the trails of the missiles as well, so you can see visual representation of the missiles in flight. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about this? Like, it doesn't look too flat, does it? I guess the the um... yeah, a little bit. It, it's just it's 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 not bad. It's just I I noticed it, and if I notice it, it'll be distracting for me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, it seems like really a CNC type of game. Like they're really going for that CNC uh, appeal with more modern upgraded graphics, like a few different uh, added abilities and stuff like that. I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I'm kind of digging it. I think I might play this game, actually. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, pretty interested. Like Honestly, like the fact that my only criticism is the flatness of the map is actually a testament to how good it looks because I had to kind of nitpick to find something I didn't like. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, if you guys want to see us uh, look into this game a little bit more, there are, is some gameplay uh, that is available to watch. So uh, let us know in the comments down below. We're going to keep going with the trailers, though, for now. Tonalization vibes. Factorio you... meets total on... Factorio meets total annihilation, dude. Yeah. Are you have you played a lot of total annihilation? Oh my it was what the original total annihilation was one of my most beloved RTSs from my childhood. Oh my days. I love the concept of that game. Oh. <laughs> well, I haven't I haven't ever played much uh, of the that series, but um this this will be right up your alley then. Yeah, it's definitely Factorio's style with that total annihilation as well. You're going to you're going to love the units coming up here as uh, also this some really cool stuff.
So yeah, I can imagine this with a lot of uh, automation, right? There's going to be a lot of things mm -hmm. that can be automated, and you're just going to be building really massive armies to be fighting against. Yeah. So less. But it seems like it's got. Uh huh. Go on. Less, less micro, more macro aspects. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 total annihilation through and through. And uh, but it seems like with the Factorio element, it's going to be like you're you're got a much more hands-on designing of that autom automation, which is kind of exciting to think about. Mm -hmm. Oh, what? What? You can go into the use of this and like that. I don't know if that's uh. I think that's just for the the trailer here, the, the going into the first person. But, <laughs> I wonder, um, yeah. This this right here, this view looks more like what we're gonna get for the gameplay, yeah. which is interesting. This, this is very overhead. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. top down, really bird's eye view, yeah. Rather than even like a StarCraft is a little bit more angled, and then those other games with that have the CNC vibe are like really hot, like yeah. hard angled. <laughs> It has that like a lot of games have that sort of like isometric angle where it's like you know not quite it's like more like two point five D angle rather than mm -hmm. like you know top down you know yeah I wonder how this is gonna this is gonna play out or is this is this actually the the angle we're gonna get or uh, I don't know it it you makes... probably change the camera angle I I wonder mm, I wonder it makes things look a little bit more flat but um it's it's probably better for like really large armies and moving things around. To be this, like uh, th this angle, and maybe you can zoom out. I'm not sure. Well, I imagine they're going to make it so you can not only zoom out really far, but change the angle in any way you want to get the angle needed to control those armies. So you can have like a more intimate, up close and personal camera angle in like the early game phases, or when you're trying to like you know control small small contingencies, but then also pull back the camera a lot and have big bird's eye view of the battle as well. Right, so let, let's just take a look at the UI for a second. We've got 100% in the middle. Uh, looks like some energy on the right-hand side and maybe supply on the left-hand side. Um, well, if it's like if it's like um, tunnelation, the energy will be literally like what you use to build things, but also the, the commander has his, his like a big backpack of energy and you can like use that for like special attacks or, you know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it'll also have some other uh, engagement with that energy rather than just building things. Right. And I guess the thing on the left is like metal or something like in Total Nation. Mm, okay. Okay. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> like an rts raid boss what was that yeah that, that was some wild stuff i'm not sure what's going to be in the final game because this is as you can see just an announcement and it's some sort of kickstarter thing i think um the ideas look fantastic though i really like the uh total annihilation series making a kind of a comeback in in terms of like that style of rts but mm. um and the the factorio aspect is really cool too oh yeah i'm actually kind of excited about that i really want to know how that plays out so i might actually keep an eye on this one in particular just because of that element because if they do find a way of like making it super fun and engaging and like setting up like the production lines to build those units and mm. it's like enjoyable to do that it, and it's not tedious then oh that could be like a really exciting way of playing rts games yeah it's gonna have to be a fine balance though that they they're gonna have to set that up but um i'm interested how the other races will play as well it seems like, like let's let's just go back a little bit you can oh, you can kind of see it in the background a little bit some of the buildings of the the opposing race pretty cool the design here like you can see they also have sort of like a factory, very but very like steampunk. Yeah, it's very steampunky, or, right? Uh, yeah, steampunky. Yeah, Zerg meets steampunk almost. Yeah, I wonder what the what the race is 
another type of um like AI, AI or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's got to be AI, right? Like, but I, I, I'm guessing by the looks of it, because it looked like that the the vehicle that was driving earlier what looked like it was autonomous, like it didn't have a driver as well. Well, it seemed like they were all autonomous, right? Basically, mm -hmm. the the premise, I guess, is that one bot lands on the planet and just builds yeah. the entire yeah. factory that creates all that army, right? It just yeah. So I'm sure I'm sure it's AI for that reason. Right, just in the beginning, consuming resources. It lands, consumes resources, and then it builds the factories. So it's like, I mean, it's a great idea. I love the 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 concept of this. Oh, I'm I'm going full screen. I'm sorry, so sorry about that. Um, I love the idea. Uh, behind this is like in the future having an ai that can just land on a planet and build up an an entire infrastructure and then an army yeah autonomously to to fight and take over uh and that's how you would really conquer cool. a galaxy or something right you would yeah. you'd have like you like ai send... that was like self-replicating yeah and they would yeah. send like lots of drones that would go out in different locations and then keep building at that new location you know what i mean yeah you wouldn't send an entire armada to you know claim one star system you would just send you know millions of these drones everywhere to just start taking over planets right and like creating infrastructure and building them out yeah, yeah. and it's, it's one thing that was so cool about the total annihilation series was that concept to me anyway like because it's everything from nothing you know it's that concept of like and that's what i think fascinates people about the rts genre in general is like mm -hmm. you know you're starting off with usually of just one building and a few workers or what have you and then you're building up a big infrastructure and that infrastructure is producing a large army and i think there's something very satisfying about that process yeah for sure well that was the last trailer that we had here guys um if you have any other rts suggestions that you'd like us to take a look at things that you're excited about uh, just uh, hit us up in the comments we'll really think about um, watching some of them in the podcast. It's really exciting to think about the future of RTS. I know both Shun and I have a deep, deep love for Brood War, but it would be cool to have some more new RTS come out. Something I, I'm excited to, to see one that I would actually, like, it, it would be amazing to have another game to cast in the future. Well, absolutely. I don't think. I, I... I think RTS is probably the hardest genre to make games for, though, because you're already working with a limited player base. And so the creative direction of your game will usually be compromised because you're already like dealing with a small pool of players to, to think about. And then if you don't, you don't want to water that player base down even more by alienating them by, say, having like, you know, high skill barriers of entry, like less automation, like Brood War, then you're not necessarily going to get the crowd you want. So until we have AI that is helping out those small indie developers, creating slightly better games and don't need to worry too much about, you know, having a high enough pull of player base, then I think we'll see some exciting stuff in the RTS scene. Yeah, there's there's some exciting inclusions here to this list. Like uh, we, we specifically didn't take a look at some of the, the really high profile ones like um stormgate and zero space uh those two games i think have enough talk about them right now i think right. they're they're getting a lot of attention right now but there's there's things to be desired for both of those games right it's not i agree i, I don't think they're going to be uh, taking over completely um we could maybe think about doing another video sometime and talking about that but uh, or about those two, but um, they they are definitely getting enough attention right now. I think. Yeah, I don't think we need to to beat that dead horse any more than it already has been. Uh, I've always had problems with like Stormgate and what have you from the start, both visually and a few other features like the gameplay and what have you. Uh, and it's also a little bit too warcraft-esque for me with how you mine resources and whatnot to really entice me on top of it all if it wasn't for the other issues right 
Yeah, we're not opposed to um, having a, a good RTS come in any form, but we want to see something that's like visually appealing, uh, that's got some of that grittiness that we love from Brood War, and uh, is going to be good for the viewer experience just overall, right? Um, yeah, we, yeah. we want to see solid like a, a game with solid micro decisions that really impact the game, really strong units that are going to, you know, be kind of break points for what the players are going for. Things like defilers, things like um, science vessels, those type of things that uh, have strong abilities that make uh, certain strategies unviable and make other strategies viable. Um, we don't want to see just massive armies smashing into each other that look like two giant blobs uh, that are like, you know... <laughs> that indistinguishable even, blobs as Indistinguishable well. blobs. Because that's just not fun to cast. Um, it's not fun to play. And it's not fun to cast. And it, it's not... Therefore, it's not really very fun to watch. So... Yeah, that... I would say the death ball mechanic is like suitable for like a mobile RTS where it's like way more automated. You know what I mean? Right. Like that's where I think that has a place. Anywhere else with like mouse and keyboard inputs, like come on now, we need to design a game which doesn't just resort into a death ball blob situation. Yeah, for sure. That's where I think the the CNC style of games like we've had um that we've looked at so far, that's where I think those do very very well like um uh, Tempest Rising we were just looking at. I yeah, think that yeah. does... I, I really do think like they hit that pretty well. Like the death... I, I just don't see that being like a death blob type of game. There's a lot of different mechanics that kind of prevent that. And, and the, the units, from what I've seen, don't move really smoothly by each other. There's a lot of like aspects of positioning and stuff like that that are... Mm -hmm. Um, going to become you know, really important in the gameplay. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's weird though because you you need the balance between you want the units to feel responsive, but you mm -hmm. almost don't want it to be so fluid that you it's too easy as well. Like, I think it's kind of strange, like because you want it to have like a little bit of jank to the point where it's like you actually have to think a bit more about the position units. But what it real boils down to is. Like in StarCraft, what the reason why we like the jankiness is because whatever you're putting your focus into will yield you a better result, right? So like mm -hmm. if you're focusing on getting units down a ramp rather than just letting them do it on their own, it helps them get down the ramp better. And that that feels good as a player, right? You putting your attention to something and it yielding a better result because you're giving it more attention feels right. good. Right, exactly. No, I totally agree. Um, and then attention becomes like a very significant resource, and it's why we have yeah. players at 400 APM because they they want to max out how much attention they they have, right? They want to they want to be able to put attention into everything, but there's like mm -hmm. a limit to that. If you're spamming out too much and putting too much attention in everything, you can't really focus mm -hmm. on anything, and you might lose out on the the greater like strategic aspect. So people generally float around like 350 APM, 300 APM is like the, the Goldilocks zone, right? Whereas if you're at yeah. like 500, it's possible to be there, but it's just not possible to, to even think when you're moving that fast or to, to move accurately at that speed. No. And I think, I don't think they can really replicate that in most of these new RTSs, though, because it seems like it's either one or the other, where it's like it's very janky, but it, it it's not so much that it help it, by putting more attention to it. It doesn't necessarily make the units perform better. It's just janky. You know what I mean? Like the units mm. just handle jankily. So I don't I don't know how they're gonna find that like sweet spot, that Goldilocks zone of it having a little bit of jank so that when you put more focus into it also has better results, but also not be too good autonomously. Cause like say StarCraft two, like links automatically surround when you attack move with them. It's like right. you don't you, there's no there's no point to focus on that anymore. You know what I mean? Mm hmm Yeah. Um for sure. You don't wanna make it so simple that there's no benefit to like extra control. Um, 
yeah for the that's viewer, a fine line to walk for the viewer aspect as well like when when there's when there is that um bit of difficulty in the way you you can appreciate it a lot more right when it's actually hard to pull off something like a, a hot pickup with a uh you know some very important unit like you're dropping a reaver and then you're really moving the shuttle to hot pick it up and then get out of there it mm -hmm. looks it, it if if it's a good player it looks smooth but in starcraft 2 literally anyone can do that with a dropship you know what i mean and and it looks way smoother but it's it's just not it's not impressive. Well, the you know what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah, because the margin for errors are so. Like, you, 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 for example, like in StarCraft 2, the pickup range on those units is so much greater. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if your shuttle's like a little bit out of position, it doesn't matter. So there's like a lot of room for error there. Yeah. So amateur players can look professional. And mm. that that feels good as a as a. As a player that's not that skilled at the game, it makes you feel good, right? But it gives mm -hmm. you that like false call of duty bravado, you know, where it like makes you feel like you're doing better than you are. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know if I totally like that, even just for that reason alone. Right. The quality that that's the big question is like quality of life at, versus the like, distinct the the ability to distinguish yourself. Um, from other players, right? If you're a hardcore player, if you're really, really putting in the time and effort to become good at a game, you want to get value out of that, right? You want mm -hmm. to, you want to be able to distinguish yourself. Whereas, if the game is like severely automated or like really very, very high quality of life, where everything just works, you know, the the pickup range is that massive, and you know, there's uh, you know, speed boosts and no acceleration time, that type of thing. So you can just um, instantly turn around your dropship or whatever. Whereas, you know, with a uh, StarCraft one, you have to, you know, continue to move to keep that acceleration going, which is adding yeah. that extra aspect of like timing and uh, control. This, these things are, um, it's in a balance. It's in a fine balance. <laughs> What, what what's so fascinating about it is like let's take StarCraft Two for example like because of how simplified the game is people are genuinely blown away at some very simple concepts being used like there was this one video where like uh, I think it was Winter StarCraft like did a thing where he like stacked loads of drones on top of each other and sent them into the pro space and then like unloaded all the drones to like quickly surround all the probes and kill them and you know surround his units kind of thing mm -hmm. but it. And it blew all the people's minds in the comments of that video, being like, what the, I can't believe that was even possible. What? And all it is to you and me as a Brutal player is just stacking workers. Mm. Like, that's not a crazy concept at all. But in the StarCraft II universe, that's a completely out there concept because of how simplified the game is that they're not even trying those kinds of things. Right. Yeah, there's um, there's there's some some nuance that's lost when you try to to automate things as much as possible there's some um like i said distinguishing that there's some level of distinguish ability to distinguish yourself from other players that's lost when uh those automated parts just come into the game and, and make things right. more accessible that's that's the problem with the bigger the studio is the more accessible they have to make the game because they have to appeal yep. to a wider audience and um, that's why I feel like a lot of my hope for the future of RTS comes from indie games um, that aren't going to need to appeal to too many people, too wide of an audience, so they can really focus in on what makes a great competitive RTS. Yeah, I agree. It circles back to what I was saying earlier, but I think that these indie companies, once they have access to like AI tools and what have you, will see some really cool stuff because... They will, the barrier will no longer be there where they, they no longer need a big dev team because they've got the AI tools to kind of supplement, right? And they'll be able to like make much more interesting projects with their tiny little indie team. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know, movies you know, having a monopoly on uh, visual content and then uh, YouTube and smartphones come along and now suddenly anyone can make pretty interesting, engaging comedy or 
uh, even right. some like more high end production stuff can come out of just small teams of people, which is uh, a huge shift. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's gonna happen as well, like you said, with AI and and these indie developers. Yeah, I mean, if you and if you look at what happened with the, the YouTube and whatnot, like those inde- independent media creators, content creators are like killing it. Like it's so much so that even like the the news channels and whatnot are basically now competing with people on YouTube, which is a crazy thing to think about that some guy on the internet is competing with the entire news networks. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. Wild. It's really crazy. Um and in a lot of cases losing. <laughs> they're not only That's competing, that, yeah. they're losing. Yeah. How mad is that? Yeah. No one would have even thought this would was possible quite a few years ago. Mm-hmm. But now not only is it possible, but it seems like hang on a minute, yeah, maybe I could do that too. Yeah. Um and we're in the we're in the the strange world now where um newscasters can you know they have their own show on Fox or NBC or something and then they they just decide to go in, independent <laughs> and they like make Tucker more Carlson, money like Tuck- yeah like Tucker oh shit yeah, yeah he's he's just blown up and now he doesn't even need the news anymore he can just make his own stuff it's crazy. It's crazy how yeah, because now branding used to be that it was branding was the company, and it's like you became the face of the company, but it was still the company was the brand. But now yeah. it's not so much that now people are the brand as much or even more so than the company. Yeah, for sure. You can you can give the people, uh, you can give your audience something that no one else can, right? Mm-hmm. Which is just you, your personality, and your your perspective. Um, but I, people, but do you not think yeah. that also? I was going to say, do you not think that also creates like a, a weird dynamic though, where some people, especially on say like YouTube Shorts or short form content creators, they're now even more incentivized to like what's the word for it? You know, uh, uh, engineer or like um, create an artifact of themselves, where it's not actually them that they're representing anymore. It's like they're they're figuring out like okay, what's the the right uh, packaging to create the brand that's going to sell well, so to speak. So they're creating a persona to sell well. So it's like, what attributes do I want to do? I want to use to create a brand of myself to sell to an audience. Right. Like I think the, there's that going on now. Creating a, a new or creating something that's not in touch with who you actually are. Mm-hmm. Is that what you mean? Because you think about. Uh, yeah, because I bet you, well, we know this for a fact, but I bet you now it's more prevalent than ever of people say, it's for, for lack of a better word, you know, basically being charlatans or grifters where like they they don't even necessarily believe the things that they're saying on their content. It's just they know that these are the things that are emotionally charged and are going to get views and are, what have you, you know. And I think that that is happening on a wider scale than ever before now where people are like almost like, being architects of their own personalities because they they know that they need to 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 really get large quantities of views these days like to really compete in this market where some some videos on like tiktok and youtube shorts are getting like millions of likes and some are getting like five likes you know to Mm -hmm. to stand out you kind of have to be emotionally charged and divisive and whatnot so you're incentivized more so than ever to create this um, you know, artificial persona, so to speak. Oh, we live in a we're we're at an interesting age now, where we're living through, you know, people that had those personalities, those crazy personalities, uh, when we were younger, uh, are like going insane now, and like losing their minds because of you know they've embodied that those personalities too much. Like I yeah I I don't remember um. There's a um, a really famous case of this, a guy who uh, was basically when we were young, getting really really popular on YouTube, and now has just kind of totally lost his mind. Are you um, avoiding name dropping him, or do you want to say? No, go ahead. If you remember his name, uh, I I don't know. I want you to say who you're thinking of. No, I'm I, I you know, know his face, but I can't remember his name. Is the problem? 
Okay. I misunderstood what you were saying. No worries, keep going. T tell me more about it. Maybe I do know. Um. Okay. Fusi tube. There we go. I just searched. Oh, Fusi. Fusi. Yeah, I know Fusi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking, um, like three different people, and Fusi would have been one of my guesses. Mm. Uh, Fusi went through like a very weird moment where um, he did what was it? He did he did like this. Oh, what was so crazy was he did just before doing like this. He had like a concert, right? And he said like Drake or something was maybe going to show up to it. So he yes. like basically was. But but he also had a podcast just before that event, and someone on that podcast was a guy by the name of Sam Pepper, and Sam Pepper at the time was like really hated, and he was like involved in some like crazy allegations, and I'm not going to talk about what was going down because I can't remember what's true and what's not, but yeah, he was involved in lots of like you know faking content and other bullshit, and everyone was hating on him. But Fusey was so unhinged that Sam Pepper was making him look bad, and that's that's saying something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everyone hated Sam Pepper at the time, but Sam Pepper was making Fusey look like a sausage monkey on that podcast. Yeah, he was completely unhinged at that time. Just going psycho, man. Absolute yeah. psycho. And I think it's because of the, what you're saying, the personality thing, right? Like he knew that he needed to be, like he needed to like double the intensity of his personality in order to garner more fans and to get more support, you know? Um, yeah. And then he like, Maybe that's kind of who he is uh, originally, you know? Maybe that's who he is at the core. But he had to, like, really amp it up, you know what I mean? And, like, lean mm -hmm. into it really hard to be popular. And then uh, he just lived that for too long. And now he's just that person, that, like, tripling of his original personality and intensity, you know? Like, just absolute maniac and <laughs> that's well, just who I, he is now i think i mean uh, the what i've seen of him i wouldn't be surprised if he was on the verge of like developing like like di like different personalities because mm. he was basically i think i think he's supposed to be muslim right am i remembering this wrong i think uh, i, I think know. if anything he was i think he was supposed to be religious and his family was religious and he was he was like parrot as he was what's the word for it like you know advising Bias. people to no yeah well, i don't know he was basically being a bit hypocritical because he was like living he was being self-righteous with his religion but at the same time living very hedonistically mm. and it's like i guess he had basically like a split personality on the one hand he was like living like uh you know like a typical westerner but on the other hand supposed to be like deeply religious and very like you know avoiding doing anything that would be considered haram kind of thing right so i think yeah like on m many levels that guy seemed like he was battling not only demons but his own identity as a result of the cognitive dissonance caused by this this persona that he was living by but also his lifestyle was like creeping in and becoming probably too much to manage and i imagine he also had a lot some mental health issues that made him more impulsive and maybe a little bit more susceptible to that kind of thing of becoming too much in the long run if he because I, I don't know how you could not go crazy like living that kind of lifestyle in that that environment and with being that popular I, I imagine most people would become a little bit fucked up to put it bluntly yeah i i think it's kind of unavoidable if you're already on the edge of mental health issues, you know, you're at the edge of decline in that yeah. aspect. And then you're insanely popular and everyone's expecting you to be crazy and to act crazy. <laughs> I like, think you're going to be crazy. That's what like, they I think like. You're end up, it's like. It's like method acting, right? You're going to eventually people like, want. become yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like... um who is it that just who played the the Joker recently and then he kind of like mentally broke after that? Joaquin uh, Felix, you mean? No, no. Um, People talk about. Uh, I had his his name on the, the tip of my tongue here, but there is another Which Joaquin Joker Phoenix. I was thinking about the Joker who never made it on screen. Um, the one from like Suicide Squad and stuff. I heard that he like kind of lost Wait, his mind. Jared Leto. Yeah, Leto. He like kind of lost yeah. his, his shit. It, it, well, 
he he was in his prime like not long after Fight Club and kind of went downhill after that. He mm. he was a great um, supporting artist in um, Fight Club, but I, I, I've not really. He's I guess you could argue that he's he's been a little bit downhill most of his career since then. Some right. people have always like kind of hated on him a little bit. Yeah, it's I I mean I, the main role that I remember him from was um that one with uh, damn it. I'm so bad at remembering uh names of of different movies and stuff, but um not into the void. There's another one. Um I'm terrible with names as well, man. Yeah, let me let me go ahead and look this up. Talk about Jared a little bit more for me. <laughs> well, uh, one thing I loved um, about Jared and Fight Club, um, there was this scene where um, Edward Norton's character is um, fighting him, and he kind of like snaps and loses it, and he's like, sp- like really punching him. To, to after he's unconscious, he just mm-hmm. keep uh, almost like he just keeps punching and punching and punching and punching him. He's really caving his face in, and then like afterwards after he's just like on the floor like just blood coming out of him and like completely disfigured and edward norton's character says i felt like destroying something beautiful mm-hmm. and there's just something so powerful about that i don't i don't, can't even like put it into words but it's such a weird thing because it's like he on the one hand he's destroying this man's face but at the same time he's admitting that he's doing it because he enjoys destroying something beautiful so he's both complimenting the man as well as destroying him at the same time. So there's something powerful in, in that and of itself. But there's also something so powerful about Jared's character never really seems resentful of him. If no. anything, it's like he did Jared a favor by doing that. It's almost like by removing his beauty, he was then stripped down to his fundamental masculinity completely. Mm. I don't know. There was something very strange and weird about that yeah, overall. Yeah, powerful scene for sure. I've got the mm. name of the movie. It's a Requiem for a Dream. Ah, oh, that's a good movie. I think, dude. Yeah, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that was that was the movie that I always remember. Uh, Jared or uh, Leto for like he was fantastic in that movie. He really crushed it. Um, and I. I don't know. I don't rate these other movies, the Morbius or the Suicide Squad or whatever. I feel like some of his his later performances haven't been good, but that that yeah, yeah. movie always sticks out in my head as like the movie that really made him um in my mind like a great actor. Yeah. Well, that movie's over 20 years old now, and that's the thing is like he he has he did have like a crazy peak in his career where he was, I would say quite highly regarded despite not maybe having as much limelight as some other actors of that era. But, but it it does seem like from that time he did go downhill ever since Mm. it has to be said. Well, he really did get into the method acting for, um, for the Joker. Joker. Apparently he was doing a lot of weird shit. Uh, and they ended up not even putting him in the movie for the most part despite him having a lot of scenes that he was supposed to be in, he ended up being kind of shuffled to the side because they thought he was too crazy. Um, <laughs> they didn't think that it was like, going to play well. To be fair, I, I would, I, I'm going to defend him a little bit. Mm. I think he's kind of set up to fail a bit. Yeah. Like, how can he compete with, say, the likes of um, Heath Ledger, for example? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because that's just the right amount of crazy, you know what I mean? It's not over the top crazy, but it is still like unhinged. It's like, uh, what's the word for it? Because you could argue that the Joker is not necessarily evil as well. It's like he's like the ultimate neutral chaos, chaos like yeah. in, in a way. Yeah, it's the kiss. The he's the ultimate chaos villain. Mm-hmm. Well, it's super. It's interesting that the most like iconic live action joker of all time is not even really like he's he's not even totally uh true to the source material you know what i mean it's not like the joker in a lot of the movies and and games and and comics and stuff like that like it's very he's very different heath ledger very very different but he he captures right. he captures that 
chaos element so well that so he's well. like he's he is like the icon iconic joker now i think even is is it true about the scene with the hospital where he he's walking away and he, he's trying to blow up the hospital with the detonator but it's not working and i think if i remember correctly i could be wrong about this but um there was actually a, an issue on set with them a misfiring mm. of that scene and but but rather than break character and be like okay we wasted the take he didn't he didn't even hesitate he kind of just acted frustrated with the detonator like the joker would and kind of just like you know start pum pummeling the detonator like come on come on come on mm. and then it blows up and then he then he carries on with the scene and he, he salvaged that scene and made it not only did he salvage that take of like because there's a possibility that 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 he could have broke character as the detonation went off and ruined the scene ruined the take and then he's they've got to pay for all those explosives and the whole set again right well, so not only really does it, he it's perfect avoid... it was perfect right yeah. <laughs> he nailed yeah, it but that's the thing he but he made the scene better yeah. is what's, what's so crazy about it that made the scene better like a, a, a fuck up became something even better and because he was method acting because he just stayed in character he, he sells it all the way no matter what happens even if they have a fuck up on set he's still gonna make the scene better because he's in character still that's that's the case for method acting right is that you can get mm -hmm. those outliers those like amazing spot on character recreations from actors um the the case against method acting of course is the the what we we're talking about like the fussy tube example where it's <laughs> the yeah. guy just gets way too into his own character you know like there's a a level which no man should go um and you just kind of start to to fall down the rabbit hole in terms of your psyche um, well there's there's one thing that I think would resemble that better than anything, which is, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's a British show called the gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, it's a guy Ritchie, there's a guy Ritchie uh, show, but it's, it's based on the film concept of the gentleman. There was a film that was called the gentleman, but they, okay. it's, it's not exactly the same. But anyway, in that there's a scene where the brother of the main character is is being made because he owes a lot of money yeah. to a, a cocaine dealer he's being made to dress up as a chicken and method act as a chicken to kind of like you know as long as he's so he's giving back like half the money he owes but he's also got to like say sorry by letting them record him act like a chicken kind of thing right right now here's the thing is like he he's really wants him to be a chicken like get the worm i want you to get the worm i want you to get the worm and he's like that's not you're not being a chicken enough no no and he's basically sell, saying to him i want to see no shred of humanity left i want you to really become a chicken right but here's the thing the guy's like taking breaks in the bathroom snorting cocaine really trying to get into it really trying to become the chicken to sell it right yeah. but eventually he snaps eventually he snaps he's like yeah i'll show you who the fucking chicken is and he gets a double barreled shotgun and blows the guy's head off and I think that per perfectly personifies what we're talking about. Mm. There's a certain level where you, when you're doing that and you're going into that headspace, there is a psychological break that occurs at some point. Right. Well, I, I have seen that scene. It's a really, really good scene. Um, if you guys haven't watched um, The Gentleman, uh, it, it is on Netflix right now. And it's fantastic British kind of, what would you call it a sitcom or like a drama uh, uh i guess crime 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 drama. crime drama yeah crime drama comedy yeah very very crazy crazy show and yeah um that kind of sets off like a series of of insane events it just keeps escalating it's one of those ones kind of like uh breaking bad or something where mm -hmm. you know things start off it's it's like a simple task do you know what i mean just Make some yep. math and sell it and get some money. And then like, things just keep getting crazier <laughs> and crazier. You know, somebody yeah. dies and then you have to cover that up. And then to cover that up, you have to do something else. And, you know, you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, I love those spiraling dramas where things just keep escalating. <laughs> and you can really see how someone can go from like a regular person um, to, you know, crime boss. Or like uh, you know, complete degenerate um <laughs> psychopath. Or at least what they do is it makes them look like a psychopath, you know what I mean? In um with with just like the series of events and like the cascading effect of 
doing something bad and then having to cover it up and having to like keep it keep going to, to keep the ball rolling you know it's like it's kind of like lying yeah. right like you you make one lie and then the lie you have to cover that lie up with another lie and you create like this web of a web of, of things. deception yeah, yeah. A web of deception of all your different lies that you're having to keep up and you become like um almost like a psychopath like having so many different lies <laughs> built up that um you know the the original thing that you were lying about probably wasn't that big of a deal it was just a simple thing you know just a simple task and now it's become like this mm -hmm. insane thing to juggle yeah speaking of the that concept that you enjoy about the, the you know the coming together of chaos basically to like you know the story starts off simple but there's like lots of different moving parts eventually have you seen the uh, like the other say guy Ritchie movies like snatch lockstock i don't know what exactly you've seen before i don't think i've seen either of those no um well, if you like that way of storytelling, I highly recommend you going back and watching some of the OG gangster movies. Like, start off with Lockstock. That's the first in the series. Then do Snatch. Okay. I think you'll really... You might not enjoy Lockstock as much as Snatch, but I think you should still watch them both in, in, in order. I think you'd really get a kick out of that. And I'd really recommend anyone listening, if you like that kind of way of storytelling, where it's like... it It's mundane, simple things, like isolated stories ending up coming together and creating this big chaos web like yeah if you like that kind of thing then snatch and lock snock stock lock stock two smoking barrels will be right up your street let's see snatch sounds really familiar let me take a look yeah uh, it's, it's actually probably one of the more popular films that we've talked about that's not something of say like um fight club kind of level of popularity snatch it's it's got so many iconic scenes in that movie. It's it's crazy how how good how well written the dialogue is and how funny it is. Cool, cool. I'll have to look at it. I'll have to watch this. Yeah, yeah. A lot of big names in there too. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, I do like those um, that that style of movie. It's funny how these um, directors really get like a they have like a certain style that they, they kind of get pigeonholed into, but they, they really do lean into it in a lot of cases, like, um, like Tarantino, like, like Tarantino. Yeah. Uh, of, you know, having the kind of like wild time, you know, going back and forth through time and, uh, everything coming together. Yeah. Um, or you've got the, that's the best thing i think when when you when you start playing with the timeline of events that's when you start to nail it because a lot of movie makers make the mistake of like being too linear with how they're showing the course of events on screen right right they're not doing like small time jumps too much if they do it's like big flashbacks or big flash forwards mm -hmm. it's never like like the, the editing of the scenes aren't like quick time jumps to make sense of something with to give it more comedic effect or something like you see in these other movies which which makes it all the more powerful and funnier yeah or they feel the directors feel like they need to like really explain that this is the past you know what i mean like yeah. have it in like black and white or something like that so that you think that it's like that you know that it's from the past you know what i mean are you without just using um, it's too on the nose yeah yeah without using just subtle hints is more than enough in a lot of cases like yeah, if you're it, very it could even be like hmm. I was gonna say it could even be like the positioning of ha the, the car journey. Like if it's like the events surrounding a car journey, it could even be like where the car is on the journey to give you an idea of what time it's talking about or something. Like it's much better when it's done subtly with that. Yeah, or just like a mark on the person's face. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you can tell like this part is after he got hit, and this part is before. You know, or uh, the the type of clothes that they're wearing. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for for example like um with uh uh what that um very famous uh pulp fiction that's the one pulp mm -hmm. fiction with the with the two assassins right they've they're they've killed somebody and they uh, have to change their clothes so they're wearing like those totally different clothes you can tell which scene and what the order of the scenes is because they had to change their clothes after they killed that guy, right? It's it's yeah, it's simple 
simple things like that that um can really make the the movie right uh, that can make those small time jumps uh very obvious um you don't need to to really expose them or you don't have to really like spell it out for the audience that this is actually in the future or the past but um yeah i i, I really like those type of uh those type of directors they they're doing something that um that that stands out and makes them you know insanely popular in the long run rather than just doing that that sort of standard thing like the the uh real expose or real real like obvious time jumps all right saying edit here because i need to take a piss really badly okay i'll come back in and reply wait, wait just just tell me when and i'm going to reply to what you said last when yeah, I think it's a tough balancing act, though, at the end of the day, because with time jumps, you, you, it's. I, I kind of want to relate it to like shaky cam action sequences. Like if you do it too much or it's it's too confusing, I think it, it, it'll, it'll just be too much of a jumbled mess. But if you do do it well, I think it can lend itself to being a very powerful uh, storytelling tool, as well as like giving you a very impressive uh, on-screen editing visuals to work with and to digest that coming together or sequences i think that's a great metaphor for the shaky cam metaphor mm -hmm. for uh, time jumps and <laughs> it's funny how these things also become really popular and you start seeing them everywhere right like one one famous director will start doing a lot of shaky cam stuff and then everybody's suddenly doing it <laughs> <laughs> every single movie has it inside it, there, there really are memes in filmmaking like there's memes and uh, you know, YouTube videos or um, people catch on, you know, in movies, um, start doing the same thing, just like in games or anything else. It's, it's, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, um, people pick up on the tropes and then they can't help but uh, embody that and like turn it into its own, like, it's, it's almost like these styles become their own genres within like sub genres of genres and like it's it's hard to avoid having that stylistic impression and it, it's almost like the art uh, the artists are like becoming their own versions of impressionists within that directorial world it just it really does show as well how few original people there are you know what I mean? How mm -hmm. everybody's kind of chasing, you know, what they think other people want to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah. this is popular right now, or this is how what people are are doing. So many people are just chasing that and trying to do yeah. what other people are doing that's successful. Whereas there's so few people who are just originally doing what they want to see, what they want to do you know what i mean and that's how that, and that's the trick to it right it's if, you, if you're making a game make a game that you want to play if you're making a film make a film that you want to see and that, that's a great way of like not only being original but having something that you're working on that you really enjoy and are passionate about there's so many followers in the world there's just so few leaders you know it's, it's um it's easier wild. to follow right yeah. this is a survival thing i think it's like a you know survival of the group when like say the reason why zebras have stripes is because you can't distinguish the zebras when they're moving in a herd they will just look like one big blur of zebra and because you can't distinguish the individual zebras the lions can't coordinate to kill the zebra mm. well it's also like uh it's a maybe a laziness thing but also just like a lack of confidence thing too i think a lot of people lack confidence maybe there's like a uh what is it? Uh... I think it's insecurity driven by a desire for security, though. And I think mm. that the desire for security is coming from that herd mentality, though. They, they want to try and like do something that's tried and true so they don't have much risk. Right. It's like an outsider effect. Something like that where uh, you feel like you don't belong, you know, like maybe you don't deserve mm -hmm. to to have the views that you have or to, to be... Um, 
as successful as you are, so you feel imposter like you syndrome. have to imposter syndrome, you have to copy somebody else. Like this is the only way that people are going to like what you have to say, right? Is if you're copying someone else, somebody else. Um, yeah. Not no confidence that you're actually worth watching. You know what I mean? That you're actually worth, or you actually have the value to just make something original and have people like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but by, 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 what, by what metric can you distinguish that? Because there's plenty of people out there that have like tons of viewers and they're not interesting at all. It's just maybe like for whatever <laughs> reason, like you've got, like, I don't know, like there's lots of, I don't want to like necessarily name drop anyone, but like, I don't know, Aiden Ross, for example, like you could argue that he's not really producing anything of value, but he still has so many eyes on him, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's people out there that are super fucking interesting, could probably have like really deep conversations with you, but they they would get like a hundred views on YouTube or whatever. Well, maybe I would argue that if they, uh, you know, really stay consistent and just keep on putting out good content, then maybe that they would eventually reach those heights. I think a lot of people who, um, they look at people like an Aiden Ross or like a a guy like a Asmon Gold or something like that where you wonder like how the hell did they get to you know millions of views and 20 30,000 live viewers on Twitch or whatever like dude those guys just put the hours in you know what i mean like mm. whether or not you like their content or you um uh really like resonate with what they're saying like they really put the hours in, man. They're there every single day and they build up that rapport with their audience. Like I'm not going anywhere and people start to really tune in and vibe with the person, you know? Yeah, well, in Asmongold's case, though, I would argue that in his, in his specific case, he actually dumbs himself down. He's way more of an intelligent guy than he lets on on stream. You mm, know what I mean? Maybe. Like, And that's what's so interesting about it is that a lot of these guys are really repackaging who they are they're either dumbing themselves down or something else to, to to make themselves more broader in their reach right and um so you're not even really getting a truly authentic experience when you are watching that person well let's talk about aswan gold a bit i think that the the dumbing down thing maybe comes from just being in contact with a massive twitch chat for you know, yeah. six, seven, eight hours a day, every single that's, day. That's the thing, right? He he, <laughs> he wouldn't be that engaging to watch if he was being too articulate all the time. Mm. Like, do you really think people want to listen to me debate philosophy all the time? They, mm. They'd get sick of it and be like, no, 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 no. I want to hear you just uh, talk about gorillas or something. <laughs> yeah, they, they want to hear me make some dumb references or talk some shit as well, right? They'd right. be bored shitless if all I did was drone on about philosophy or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, oh, he's he's a great entertainer. I enjoy him a lot. I enjoy his videos. Um, I don't think that I could engage with Twitch chat for that many hours, though. Like, that's... That's that is serious dedication, man. What he's what he's done. I think a lot of people they underestimate like the number of hours that have been put in by some of these Twitch streamers and and YouTube oh, yeah. creators to gather that well, level of audience. You know, it's crazy. Well, yeah. Well, what Asman Gold did so geniusly was that one of his biggest strengths was that he was he was a wow grinder like mm -hmm. he could handle playing wow for like 20 hours a day yeah that was okay for him that's normal for him and most people be like well i can't spend 20 hours a day working at my job asman gold said yeah i can do that i can turn on the stream and like stream crazy amounts of hours every day that's no big deal that's why people like asman gold and xqc are so powerful in their in their fields is because they have that consistency where they're happy to stream crazy hours that no one would be usually caught dead doing and they do that consistently and so they have such huge reach because here's the thing if you if you're if you're if you're like a bit of a, a no life viewer yourself where you don't say like you, you you've got like eight to 12 to 16 hours a day free to watch someone you're going to tune into the guy that's streaming the most because you want to be able to watch that guy as often as possible if he's only streaming four hours a day five days a week you're not going to be that interested but if he's streaming eight hours 12 hours 14 hours a day every single fucking day 
that's a streamer you can really build a parasocial relationship with. Mm, that's true. And you're just hitting more hours. Like people are up or they have uh, free time at different times of the day. So you're just able to hit more viewers. Um, but, but, it, but, but, but I mean, quite literally, people enjoy, say, putting on a stream while going to sleep or something. And if you're not streaming crazy hours, then you're not going to get that kind of viewer where it's like, I want to put on someone's stream to go to sleep to because yeah. he knows that you're not going to be around for it. Whereas if he knows you're going to be streaming 12 hours regularly, you can just put your stream on every time he goes to sleep. It's funny that that's a, that's a thing, you know. <laughs> You're gonna put on someone's stream. Well, people uh, don't want to be lonely. Like, humans, humans don't want to be lonely, right? And I they'll know, put on it's... anything to distract themselves from realizing they're lonely. The TV, the radio, a, a stream, a podcast, yeah. it just distracts you from being lonely, right? Yeah, it's it's funny. They just want to hear like a human voice or something like that. That's mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting part of human behavior. It's funny that that's become like a, that's actually like a demographic of people that you might want to hit as a Twitch streamer is the people <laughs> who want to listen to, you know, as they fall asleep. <laughs> and then you're getting that person watching your stream while they're sleeping as well. So you're getting like a viewer that's also watching for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. That's right. That ad revenue or whatever is coming in. Oh, strange. It's a weird world that we live in, Shun. Very strange. Oh, very strange, dude. And very divisive as well. It's divide and rule everywhere you look. Yeah, tell me about it, man. There's um there's so many things trying to take your attention as well. That uh like distractions that are going on all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another thing we could talk about because in StarCraft, you have not multi, there's no such thing as multitasking. That's a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's task switching. It's the mm -hmm. ability to go from doing one task to another and back again seamlessly, right? That's yeah. what we really are talking about. You're not doing multiple things at the same time. You're just switching back and forth between multiple things at the same time, mm -hmm. like the plate spinning analogy. And uh, I. I, I, I see this being a problem in society now. It's not. It's no longer that we're being divided in terms of just our political views or relig religious views or what have you. Or we're also being divided of our attention now. It's like it's a battle for your attention. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everything's a battle for your eyes now. That's what's important. Your eyes are what. Is that the, there's a war for your eyes going on right now. Everyone is bowing for your attention. Because they know how powerful that attention is. There's something almost occultish about it, if anything. Like it's almost like this, like power, where if you've got eyes on you, like things are like, you're capable of things. You know what I mean? And the, mm -hmm. the people that have more get more. What's that law called? I think um, John Peterson, John Peterson talked about it, where it's like there's this like fundamental law in nature where those that have a little get a lot, and those that have nothing don't get anything you know what i mean so but by having more you also attract more right to those that have a lot everything will be given something like that mm -hmm. those yes that have um, nothing everything will be taken something like that I exactly yeah it, and, and that's that's what's happening with the attention thing those that have all the attention they're gaining everything and those that are giving the attention are losing everything because they're giving away their attention and not doing anything for themselves they have these parasocial connections and not focusing on themselves right right yeah the war for attention is um kind of wild to think about and uh to think about the ramifications of like adding ai to that like how is it going to capitalize on people's attention how is it going to like seize our attention more than you know basically anything else i think is is the fear that it's just going to like completely uh suck up everybody's attention at kind of an insane rate mm -hmm. and where where will it be sending that attention to right like well yeah and more dangerously um the ai will be able to train in how to best capture your attention mm -hmm. so we we are we are fucked in that sense <laughs> because the ai will know us better than we do so we'll be like literally like putty in the ai's hands in terms of our ability to fight against that because the ai could like think of like oh, what kind of game is going to captivate these guys so much that like literally they can't stop playing it like it gives you such a dopamine hit with the gameplay loop that it's just so addictive that you can't physically or you can't physically want to put it down and so, you can't not think about it some 
like combination of Candy Crush and Farmville or something like that that just right. makes you so or at least certain people just grind just sucks them in so hard that they can't they can't escape it. They can't pay attention you give to anything it, else. Yeah, then you give it some sort of freemium element. So the people that can't give it enough attention are like willing to pay money to not need need to give it constant attention. Mm. Yeah, as long as and then you can give your attention to something else that the AI is generating. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay not to give your attention to that so that you can pay attention to something else. It's crazy. That's basically what you're doing, right? Have, mm. Think of that. That's essentially what it's boiling down to. We have been doing that on a kind of like a like a primitive level, like with freemium gaming and what have you. You're, you're paying to not have to play the game, essentially. So yeah, because you're, you're, your attention is more valuable at your job. The same reasoning for like, why would you get a guy like guy to tile your bathroom? Well, if I'm earning more per hour than I'm paying the guy to tile my bathroom, why would I tile my bathroom myself? That'd be the logic for that guy, right? Right. That's wild. And that's what we're gonna and we're gonna start doing that with all sorts of things in our lives. And we're gonna think it's normal to do that. And then we don't even realize that our attention is our attention and time is our biggest commodity that we don't value enough. Hmm. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Give all my attention to StarCraft. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's like, I would say maybe like 80% of yeah. my, my attention, my time is, um, to Starcraft. And actually I've been playing a little bit of, um, Cosmonarchy recently too. I, I, I remember I showed you that, mm. uh, we talked you a did. lot about other RTS games, but there is a mod for Brutal War that's come out recently. Uh, I think it's 2023 that it really, uh, got released. And uh, it's totally like um, just a fan of Brood War and someone who uh, is like a, a total indie developer, but they've taken Brood War and just completely altered it. They've changed it into right. like a like a what what would you say like a Frankenstein mess? Or yeah, like a, it's almost like if you had like a nightmare and it was like a parallel demonic realm of Starcraft, that would be it. You know what I mean? Like it's totally out there compared to what the original Starcraft's like, but it's still enough like Starcraft where it's uncanny and like unsettling almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a monstrous game that has uh, a crazy amount, and we're not talking about just like a normal mod like a, a UMS of StarCraft. This requires like a, a totally different download of the game. Plus you have to have like this whole addition, um, the different launcher and everything to get this thing up and running, um, which is quite a a process. I think they're they're trying to, to make it more simple. I was able to do it though. So, I mean, it's not like you have to be a genius to figure it out. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's, it's interesting. Like it is very interesting the way that they they've put it together. Um, there's so many different units. Like I was saying, there's like uh, each building that you have gives you access to. I think it was six different units, something like that. Mm. And then there's all kinds of different um, iterations of the units and and different like it, it's crazy. It's so hard to explain. It it's not even really possible to just give it the to, to to explain it would take me uh i think hours honestly to well, to tell you all the maybe differences in the depending on how much of a challenge that would be maybe in the post that you could have like while we while you were just talking about that have like a little uh edit of some footage from that gameplay. sure sure we could probably Have do you that. playing it or something the yeah. main the main thing is in the game is like there's no upgrades at all they've completely removed the upgrading aspect um and the uh, tiers there's like tiers of units and instead of just being you know tier one tier two tier three there's it goes up to like tier eight you know what i mean like it just keeps on going yeah. so the depth is really really uh it, it gets really really deep um and there's a lot of other changes <laughs> There's <laughs> so many and the dimensions. Units can actually, and the units can actually morph into upgraded versions, right? Yeah, that's for Zerg. Um, they can upgrade, the, the units can upgrade themselves um, 
pretty much every single unit has a kind of like a lurker goes into an egg and then becomes a different unit. Every single unit has that. Even the drones can morph into different units. It's really, really wild. Pretty uh, wild. Yeah. Every single building has like a kind of like a, you know, a spire into greater spire morph as well. Um, mm -hmm. They, they all can, can do that or, a, you know, a hatchery to a layer and into a, a hive like multiple tiers of morphs um there's there's also some like age of empires-esque like really expensive tier unlocking things with how crazy the buildings and the building upgrades can be right like lots of really high gas count to actually make the building or upgrade the building to unlock yeah. the next tier or not they get they get to this really kind of insane expensive tier like as you go up and up and up and up you can imagine that things get more and more and more expensive and if you're going all the way to tier eight things can get really expensive and the reason is uh that that's even possible is that there's no limit on supply there's no limit on supply and there's no overlords or, or supply giving units you just keep making units um yeah, which, it's all about yeah it's all about the making of the units and the resource gathering because like say for example the gas you can mine like you can mine the gas even without a geyser but making the geyser makes it mine faster and then you can even upgrade the geyser to make the geyser mine faster but then you have like the downtime of like you can't gain the resources while it's upgrading so there's some interesting dynamics going on there with yeah. the resource gathering and the ge the geysers never run out and the minerals can go depleted so you like you get a depleted mineral patch it returns less minerals than a regular mineral patch so they never run out they never none of the resources ever run out which can you know can take you into some insane late game scenarios where you know you could be you yeah. know, tier seven tier eight with you know seven eight bases and hundreds of workers which is just <laughs> you, wild I'm, I'm gonna have to get this you're gonna have to help me uh, get this, and I'll, I'll put it on a play of you sometime because it does seem yeah. really intriguing. We'll play it sometime. Um, a lot of the games are yeah. very short. Like you can still have like a lot of early game strategies, and I it seems like that's the way that the games are playing out now. I actually played a bunch of games against some uh, people online. I played some, you know, some of the players that are really into it, and mm -hmm. the games. There, there's a lot of early game strategy that is mixed in and you, you know you can very easily die in the early game i haven't made it to those super super late game scenarios yet but there's so much complex complexity um yeah that it's it's really easy to lose before you ever get there well there's also like so many different buildings i was actually surprised i thought it was actually going to be really simplistic because it was mm -hmm. stripped down in the sense of like no upgrades and whatnot but then i saw like there was just so many different buildings you're making i was like what what's that what's that what's yeah. that and it just like yeah it just seemed crazier and crazier the longer you played yeah there's there's a million different buildings and um the same thing for all the races for terran and, and protoss is no different um there's like uh, all these new models and and units that you've never seen before that you could never imagine being in brood war but uh it it is like you said a fever dream where <laughs> there's yeah. like these crazy units that never existed in brood war that kind of look like brood war units but it's like dude what even is that <laughs> It's like it's what I would imagine if I if I got sent to hell and and Satan told me we're gonna play a game of Starcraft. That's what I imagine the race that he would play would look like. You know what I mean? <laughs> and like I had no chance in doing anything against it whatsoever. Right. He didn't have any of the same restrictions or limitations that you did. <laughs> yeah, and he's got these like these like really high health units early on in the game that I just can't do anything about. I'm like, okay, <laughs> this seems fair. <laughs> You're just playing with your regular hydras and lings. <laughs> just getting decimated. Yeah. He's pulling out all the crazy... There's a lot of crazy names for these different units, too. One thing that kind of annoys me about the game is that a lot of the units that are exactly the same have different names, and then other ones are the same, and they have the same name, which is it's kind of weird to me. Like, mm. the, uh, the Zergling is like the Zethricor. And then the hydralisk <laughs> is the hydralisk. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> why? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, though. Like, naming things is actually kind of hard unless you've got for it. Yeah. So uh, I imagine that maybe he, whoever's making this, needs a little bit of a hand with like generating names for the units or something. Maybe. 
But I don't understand why an overlord's not an overlord. It's an ovalith. Ovalith? And like a hat- <laughs> hatchery is like a hatchelisk or something. Hat- hatch- hatchelisk? I can't remember. Yes, it's like different for the sake of being different, but yeah, not different enough. Yeah, a little bit. That 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 does annoy me a, a slight bit, but it you know it is what it is. It's it's a kind of a crazy game, and there's there's yeah. like all these different morphs of those different units, which I mean, um, maybe they couldn't think of like a good name that relates to that to zergling to be the morph of the zergling you know what i mean um so they wanted to do a different name that would be in more in line with the later stages you know the higher tiers so that it makes more sense you know as you go up the chain of right. tiers I, i'm not sure exactly but i think we could just have different variations of ling like you've got the zergling as the base and then you like say for example in stock of two that bane ling right right, it's right. The, 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 it, yeah so you could just use the same like suffix or whatever to the word and then just have different affixes or whatever seems like they didn't want to go that route but it's an interesting thing i played a little bit of it on stream i might do some more in the future um it's funny that m- maybe in 2024 the best rts might be a, a mod of starcraft Brood war that would be kind of hilarious <laughs> it would be kind of funny but also i think kind of like sad must have worked for it. <laughs> yeah but depressing for sure but also like would would kind of make sense like a, like a, something that's depressing but also kind of expected like it makes right. sense like oh yeah it's, it, it makes sense that it would be this Right. In a sad way. Well, it's uh, it's something that you can't underestimate, right? You just hear, oh, it's a mod for Brood War. There's been some mods that have come out that have spawned entire like industries or entire genres of games, like uh, Dota, for Dota. example, right? Like that's the big one mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, yeah, it's just a mod for Warcraft, but like look at look at what it became. Over time, people loved it. People played it. It became like this massive hit sensation, and it spawned its own genre. How come that can't yeah. happen with Brood War, right? I certainly could. The only issue would be the audience, and I think that what games companies are trying to do now to kind of like revamp things is like kind of hybridize the genres of the games a little bit yeah. and kind of like mix mash things so i'm wondering if there's a way of like mix mashing the the starcraft rts vibe with something else that kind of becomes a totally new thing and people like really jive with it yeah i don't know i don't know where that's going but i i i enjoy cosmonarchy it's it's interesting it's like uh, a whole new world opened up into a game that I I'm very passionate about. I love a lot, so I'm I'm thinking it's kind of a cool a cool way. But mm-hmm. I'm going to be watching out for other RTS as well to kind of blow me away and and take some of my very important attention, <laughs> <laughs> snag some of that resource. Uh, nothing's come along quite yet though. That's that's really uh, no deserving of that scratching my itch yeah, yeah that um, i agree critical resource and it is such a valuable resource i think we should be more careful with what we give our attention to in general mm. and um but there's a lot of things out there that maybe won't ever get a lot of attention but still are deserving of a little bit and maybe like the starcraft community like it's not a big scene, but there's still a lot of eyes on it to keep it alive. And I think that that's all we need for these new titles. You need just something and you need enough eyes to get going. You don't necessarily need to like storm the market and take over a big market share, right? You just need something that's going to hold enough attention. So you've got the player base to like actually produce a game and then maybe make a good sequel eventually or something. Yeah. Storming the market, taking over. These are like, if you're putting a hundred million dollars into a video game, this is probably what you're aiming at, but it's not the right way to aim when you're looking to make a great game, you know, that really gets people, uh, and has longevity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, unfortunately the way that a lot of companies have to look at 
creating a game though because they need to make that money back right yeah and that's the big issue it will cool comes down to money like every like everything else so if there's no incentive there you're not gonna you're gonna see them even take a stab at it because there's, there's no money in it for them so why would they it's just it's wild that we're not even seeing you know blizzard try to take a stab at making another rts when there is so much money to be made it's kind of wild that they're <laughs> they're just sitting on their hands you know yeah oh it's crazy it's because, it's because the boardroom would just say well we got starcraft 2 we got that ip why would we waste money on a new ip i don't know i don't know it feels like maybe they're too bogged down like maybe they're uh, i don't know maybe they're like the live service model is maybe showing some cracks you know what i mean where the huge companies these massive companies they create a game they make their money out of it but then they have to keep like live servicing this game forever mm -hmm. and it, it like bogs them down so they don't you know they don't they have still income coming from the game but it's like it's still taking up so much of Where's their the resources income, yeah. It's taking up so much of their resources for making the next game, you know, um, that they're not able to like keep moving forward. Um, whereas the older style of creating a game is like, okay, you just put the game out there. You don't keep live servicing it. You let players control their own servers, you know, and just keep the game alive. Um, where then you can just move on to like the next thing you know what i mean yeah but the problem is is that the, the newer developers and publishers they want total control so they won't give that kind of like open source access to the players to to run the game for themselves you know what i mean like they like say yeah. blizzard like took away the ability to have like offline events and there's like online only for stock right. or two right right they, they, they deliberately take away that freedom and control which yeah. is course which also creates the problem in the first place yeah, but then yeah, they then they have the that get forced to just keep putting in sinking in money and resources into these things forever. I don't know. As a long term strategy, I think live service has a lot of drawbacks. Yeah. Uh, it can't be helped though. I mean, there's, there's certain games and especially if you're dealing with like balance changes or whatever have you like you do need to have some form of life servicing going on mm -hmm. you could you could outsource it to the players to do their own balance changes and other patch changes and stuff but that's not usually going to happen like most companies won't be comfortable doing that kind of open source format it's going to be interesting with uh starcraft 2 now being balanced by the community i'm very curious yeah. to see you know where the the game is actually going to move is it going to move well, into it, a better state or is it going to slowly fall off and die well i hope it does go into a better state because in a way it's like a, an experiment that could encourage other games companies to do the same so in a way i'm kind of hopeful for it like i don't really care about starcraft 2 in general but as far as the games industry is concerned i think i, I wish the best for that kind of project because I would like to see that be a more viable option in general. So I hope it does go well for that reason. That would be, yeah, it would be really cool if they just, if companies saw that there was like a huge success with something like that. And then they just, from the outset, you know, they release the game and then they're like, okay, we're going to leave balance to the community. And they yeah. just hands off let the community like figure out what to do with the balance and, and like, that would be a selling point for the game right can you imagine right. like every if, if the game is even halfway decent everyone's going to want to talk about the game and that every everyone's going to comment on that like oh it's so cool they like literally like let the players balance the game that's going to be what everyone talks about if it's a good game right right and it's a selling point in of itself and then it takes away so much of the like the onus or the like um the blame off of the company if the game's <laughs> like you're falling into like a bad state you know what i mean they don't yeah. have to they don't have to own, have ownership over that anymore it's just like well the community this is what they wanted and that's what they did <laughs> but, uh, that, that's but, but now, the, now, the, now the real question is is it ever possible for humans to do that as in 
to know what they actually want or is it just mm. what they think they want and not what they actually want you know what i mean yeah i wonder if they could actually make it into a decent product and like be good experiment any, if anything I, if anything i think someone should do that as just a really interesting social experiment yeah i agree well they're doing it at blizzard right now yeah maybe uh, hey guys little uh, conspiracy theory here maybe that's the whole point maybe this is just a big data scrape this is one big like social <laughs> experiment and they're they're using their ip for nefarious means they're training yeah. some ai on some stuff <laughs> <laughs> any of you guys involved with the starcraft 2 balance you're just being scraped <laughs> right now for data <laughs> I wonder if that'll ever become like a phrase, like scraped, you know what I mean? Like hashtag scraped. Or like, <laughs> you, I'm, just, I'm just being scraped, you know what I mean? You can make it right now. I mean, the yeah. world is your oyster. I just oyster. coined it. You coined it. I just coined it. Scraped. It's, it's like scraped. scuffed, but scraped. It's scraped. Data scraped. All right, guys. Well, I think that we're going to end the, the podcast here. I'm glad that we're still doing this, Shun. I was afraid that we were going to start to fall off. We missed three weeks. We've just started yeah. this thing. We're on episode five. We got to keep it going, man. Yeah, we had some scheduling issues, but we're going to get right back into it here. I'm excited to, to keep this going regularly again. Yeah, I think it was fun uh, taking a look at some trailers, too. Uh, we can add more visual aspects into the podcast. And guys, if there's anything you guys want to see... Um, us cover or talk about or uh, you know game upcoming games that you want to see us discuss on the show or anything else just let us know in the comments we won't necessarily follow your uh, recommendations but you know we'll we'll definitely consider them and um, yeah you might see see us talking about them in in a future episode yeah at the very least we'd be very excited to see what feedback you have got so please do like leave any suggestions feedback criticisms down below and uh, maybe we'll follow it, maybe we won't. All right, guys, thanks for watching Doom Drop episode number five. We'll be back next week, uh, episode six. See you then. Thanks, guys.